Okay, so uh, before um, starting with lecture two, I would like to uh, add a few clarifications on, uh, on yesterday's lecture. So first of all, I mean, of course, there are plenty of reviews on uh, equivalent cohomology, equivalent localization, and so on. Let me just point out one that I found, which is relatively short uh, and concise. Um, this is by Alex Siv. And it's called Notes on uh, Equivalent Localization. And it is from 2000, if I remember correctly. Uh, again, this is just one. Uh, the other thing um, so that, that created a bit of confusion was the story with the metric whether we, didn't any we, we need the metric or not. Uh, um, and, and so, in fact, I mean, this, this um, metric is um, if you want, totally auxiliary element in the following sense. So suppose that you start with a manifold M, and in particular, as I will stress in a minute, this has to be orientable manifold. And let's say that we only start with the U1 action on it. Um, so we don't specify the metric to begin with. Uh, of course, from this U1 action, we, uh, we get our vector field V. Uh, and then what about the metric? Well, uh, in general, any um, smooth manifold, we can put a Riemannian metric. So let's choose a generic metric, some G tilde. Um, of course, this in general is not U1 invariant, but now it's very simple. We just have to average over, over this U u1 action, and this in general gives us a u1 invariant metric. So in this way, we can get our g for which v is a killing vector. And then, in fact, if, if you look in the final formula, of course, there is no the metric. So we use the metric and various steps to construct this dual form. And uh, okay, going through this process, any metric that does the job is, uh, is OK. But in fact, this always exists. Um, so yeah. Um, we don't need to specify the metric, but in fact, the, always the, uh, the, there exists uh, at least one. In fact, there exists uh, many. Um, however, let me stress the importance of orientability. So this M should be orientable. This also caused some conf confusion. Some of you had questions about this. Well, first of all, we need M orientable in order to define integration. If you remember, when you define integrals of forms or manifolds and you have patches, you need uh, some globally defined volume form, so you need uh, orientability. So we do want this M to be orientable. Uh, and this also shows up in the final formula, because in the final formula, what ap appears is the Pfaffian of this uh, action that I call M uh, L uh, V at P. So I remind you what, uh, what is the definition of this Pfaffian. So if you have an anti-symmetric matrix, so this M is not this M, this is anti-symmetric matrix. Uh, then the Pfaffian of M, if I uh, have the coefficients uh, correct, this should be 1 over 2 to the L. And let's say this is 12 by 12. Uh, L factorial, and then you take uh, uh, L copies of the of the matrix I1 I2 I2 L minus 1 I2 L, and then you contract with one epsilon tensor, uh, and so in particular since there is one epsilon tensor, of course if you do a, a change of coordinates or a basis. Uh, which has negative determinant, of course, this ch uh, changes sign. So this is not invariant. This is only invariant if you do, if you preserve the orientation. And so uh, when we, this, this change of coordinates, where the U, U1 action was written as a, uh, a rotation in the various planes, uh, we have to do it in a way that preserves uh, orientation. Uh, the other property of the Pfaffian, of course, is that the square of the Pfaffian uh, is equal to the determinant, uh, but then the determinant contains two copies of epsilon, so the determinant is invariant under generic change of basis. Is this more clear? Okay. So, 
So, uh, so, uh, so yesterday we were discussing uh, um, the, the objects that we would like to compute. And so these, wa these are uh, uh, path integrals um, uh, of, uh, of our theories. Uh, and uh, although uh, I will not discuss, so I will just discuss just path integrals, so integrals on all three configurations of uh, weighted by the classical action. Uh, however, in general, we might be interested in insertion of operators. Uh, of course, if we insert local operators, we could trade this by including sources. But if we insert non-local operators, this might be more complicated in terms of sources. Uh, so we might want to just insert operators in the path integral. And uh, mm, I will not discuss this in details, but I just uh, wanted to give, give, give some, some comments of this. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would like to stress that, uh, uh, I mean, very loosely speaking, we can distinguish somehow three types of, of operators that one can try to define. Okay, this is not a sharp classification. Um, so first of all, uh, I mean, the, the, the most basic type of operators are uh, what we can call, so let me put in quotation mark, order operators. Uh, and so these are simply defined in a standard way as some uh, uh, function, uh, usually some polynomial function or, or something like that. Uh, well, some uh, function in the uh, fundamental fields uh, that we have in the Lagrangian. If we start, of course, we want to do path integral, so we need a Lagrangian formulation of our theory. And these are just funct some functions of the fundamental fields at our disposal. And this function can be either local or non-local. If they are local, we have local operators. But more generally, we can have non-local operators. So these are functions of fundamental fields. By fundamental fields, I mean the fields that you use in the Lagrangian. Um, and as I said, so one example is some local operators, of course. I don't know, you are in a gauge theory, and uh, I don't know, it's a U1 gauge theory, so you want to make insertion of the field strength, for instance. Uh, but of course, you can also consider interesting non-local operators, and um, again, in a gauge theory, an interesting class is given by Wilson lines. So these Wilson line operators, they are defined by uh, some contour uh, gamma. So let's say we have some closed contour. Uh, this is some line. This is well, some one-dimensional line. Uh, and they are also parameterized by some representation of the gauge group. And they are defined as uh, the trace in this representation of the path order the exponential of uh, uh, the integral along this line of uh, A, the, the gauge field. OK, this is not just a polynomial in A, but still is some function in A. Um, then there is another interesting class of operators that we can call disorder operators. And this one, instead of being defined as inserting some function of the fundamental fields in our path integral, so in particular, let me stress, so here, how do we compute correlation functions of this? Well, we have our path integral, integral of all field configurations. Uh, then we just insert the operator uh, in, the, in the path integral. So this, in general, is some function of the field, some functional of the fields, and the action as well. So this, loosely speaking, uh, is computing. So this will be the unnormalized uh, uh, correlation function. So what about these other operators? So this operator, instead of being defined as some function of the fundamental fields, uh, this is defined by removing some points from spacetime, either a point if you want to do some local operator, or some submanifold if you want to do some non-local operator, and then specifying boundary conditions. Um, often these are diverging boundary conditions, some singular boundary conditions for the fields, uh, either at the point or along this submanifold. So we have our spacetime manifold M, 
in principle, we might want to remove a point. So somehow here we have a small boundary, which is some small sphere, and we specify some boundary condition for the fields on this, on this uh, sphere. And uh, uh, so these are uh, around uh, uh, point or uh, submanifold. Uh, and uh, uh, and then so uh, so we do this so this gives us the definition of the of the operator and then how do you use this because really I mean we have defined an operator if you can compute any correlation function for this operator so how do you compute correlation function on this uh, or this order well uh, simply we do the path integral so we do the path integral we don't insert anything here uh, but we, do, we don't do this integral over a smooth D configurations, rather we do this integral over a fin configuration which respect this boundary condition around the point. So if you want with boundary conditions uh, corresponding uh, to this operator OD. Um, so these are boundary conditions that we use in the path integral. And uh, uh, just to give you some examples, uh, well, we're not going into details, I will just mention some examples. These are, for instance, Toft line operators. In uh, four dimensions. Or something which is very similar is monopole operators in three dimensions. And uh, so, for instance, if we want to construct these monopole operators in three, in three dimensions, so these are local operators, uh, while these, uh, well, as the name says, these are line operators, these are not local. So these monopole operators are local, and they are defined by specifying that if we want to insert the operator at some point, then we remove the point, we have a small S2, and we impose that, uh, uh, well, they say that the integral on S2 of F should be in some conjugacy class. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, well, we can, again, loosely speaking, uh, introduce a third type of operators that we can call the fact operators. And so this time, what we do, again, this can be either local or non-local, uh, and so what we do is that we have either a point or some submanifolds. This is particularly interesting if we have some submanifolds of dimension, uh, say, bigger than zero. Uh, and then we introduce some extra fields that are not fields that live in the whole space time, they only live on the operator. So we introduce some local degrees of freedom on the operator, uh, and then in our path integral, we will have to integrate over the bulk degrees of freedom that we have in our bulk theory, uh, but also on these localized degrees of freedom. So this corresponds to some extra uh, localized uh, degrees of freedom uh, on some sub-manifold. You need to specify the boundary condition for bulk field. That the boundary condition for the bulk field near the defect? Yes, yes. So, this, uh, so then you will have to, so these localized degrees of freedom will be coupled to the degrees of freedom in the bulk, and you might want to in include some boundary conditions, some extra boundary conditions. So, as I said, so these three classes are not uh, separated classes. So, are, if you want three mechanisms or three ways that we can use to construct operators, but there are overlaps. So when you introduce this degree of freedom, we want to specify also some boundary conditions. You might want to insert also on top of that some fields that live in the bulk. So then it will be a mix of the three. So as I said, this is not a, a classification. It's, it's, yeah. 
some ways that we have to, to construct operators. Um, uh, so in this case, so we have our manifold M, we have some sub-manifold, uh, I don't know, uh, okay, that N uh, of lower dimension, and then if we want to compute once again a correlation function of these operators, up to the fact that we might have boundary conditions and so on, essentially now we integrate over the fields uh, that live in M, but also on the fields that live in N, and uh, here, so there will be some piece, so we'll have our bulk action, uh, but then there will be some, uh, um, some other uh, action that lives on the operator. There will be a function of n, and of course these fields will be, I mean, we, we will be coupled in general to the one in the bulk, so this will all also be some function on... Uh, of the fields in the bulk, but, but this action lives on, uh, on the submanifold. Okay? So just to give you a simple example, so suppose that we have some line gamma, as we had here, there. So this is some gamma, it's one dimensional. We might want to introduce, for instance, some fermions <laughs> along this line and uh, write an action. Uh, which is just the integral on this line. Uh, this is some uh, parameter tau along the line uh, of these fermions. And then it's very natural to take this fermion to transform under the bulk gauge field, if we had a gauge theory in the bulk, uh, and then to couple them to the bulk gauge field. So this tau, this a tau here is the bulk uh, gauge field. Uh, but of course this is uh, projected, or more precisely, this is pulled back uh, to the, to the sub-manifold, to the line gamma. Okay, so... Uh, so, okay, so as I said, these are not separate classes, but roughly speaking, we have these, uh, these classes of operators. Um, and uh, uh, then we can use in general, but so what will concern us, although uh, once again, we will not, I will not discuss example, I will just say something about the first class uh, or the operators. Uh, but, but the point I want to make is that bo both classes of, uh, all classes of operators can be treated uh, with uh, localization. Okay, so localization, supersymmetric localization can address the, the three types. And in fact, this has been discussed in the literature in various theories and in various types of operators. Do we have any questions? So how many is uh, supersymmetry for this, uh, for this type of, uh, for this uh, body theory? Yeah, so here I'm not even talking about super. So this is be, this has nothing to do with supersymmetry. This is something that you can do in general. Yeah, but uh, localization in this theory. Yeah, so if you want to use localization, so first of all you need a supersymmetric theory. Then you want that uh, the operators also preserve some supersymmetry. Uh, in general, they will preserve some fraction of the supersymmetry. <coughs> then if you want to use localization, of course you want you have to use to be able to use the supercharges that are a subset of the supercharges that are preserved by these operators. And of course, so each case will have a separate discussion if you want to go into the details. Uh, but, but this, as in principle, I mean, there's nothing to do with supersymmetry. Yeah. What's the difference between order operators and defect operators? Uh, as I say, there is no crucial difference in the sense these are not separate types. Uh, in general, an operator can have, uh, in, in, I mean, uh, all, all types of features. But I just want to make the, uh, so if you want in order operators, which are the most standard ones that is discussed usually in textbooks, you take, so you have some theory in D dimensions, you have some fields that you use to write the Lagrangian, and then you construct gauge invariant combinations, and they're either local or not local, you insert them in the, in the, in the Lagrangian. Uh, the point is that you can construct more general operators in which you include some degrees of freedom on the, on the defect. So in this sense, uh, well, this is why I call it defect. So it's, uh, defect operators are more general. Yes. Um, 
still, uh, as I said, these, uh, these are not separate in many sense. For instance, you can have some operators which, which can be represented in different ways, and nevertheless, they are the same operator. And so, uh, and so I want to leave you with an exercise. Um, so suppose that you want to study uh, one of these uh, order operators, which is the Wilson line, uh, for some gauge group G uh, in representation R. Now it turns out that the very same operator, you can represent it as a defect operator. So if one, this is the same as some defect operator uh, in which uh, you use the following. Uh, so it will be a one-dimensional defect operator because this is a line. And uh, uh, the, the action that you have to use, in fact, is very similar to, to the example here. Um, so let me first write it and then comment. Uh, so this is the action that you have to write, well, that you can write. Uh, so what are the various objects here? So this A tilde is uh, a one-dimensional U1 gauge field. So if you wish, you have, uh, with respect to this example here, you also have a gauge field on the, on the line. Uh, this A tau is the one in the bulk. So if you want this, is the pullback of the bulk uh, uh, G gauge field. And then if psi, these are fermions, which are uh, in uh, representation uh, R under uh, A, so the one in the bulk, and they have charge one uh, under A tilde. Okay, so this shows even more that these are not really separate classes. Is there a magic stick? Oh, it's okay. okay. So, uh, so, okay, so now, uh, so we have motivated uh, yesterday why we're interested in computing uh, partition functions, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, if it, uh, path integrals of Euclidean theories on compact manifolds that I will call just partition functions on, on compact manifolds. So we're motivated why we want to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, we will be able to compute them using uh, um, a quantum field theory version of localization that uses supersymmetry. So of course the, the first step is to construct a supersymmetric theory on the, on the curve manifold. Uh, and this is precisely what uh, Guido is teaching us uh, uh, how to do. However, let me just say a few things that overlap with what he said. Uh, and uh, um, well, maybe a couple of facts that he has not yet explained, I will just mention, and then in his lecture you, you, you will see in full glory. Okay, so we want to understand supersymmetry on curve manifolds. Uh, once again, this is, I mean, th there is some repetition, but I think in this school there will be various repetitions. Uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing to hear an important concept uh, various times. <coughs> Uh, 
And of course, Guido should correct me if I say something wrong. I don't know where he's here. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, of course, tri trivially. So, I mean, one start in Lorentzian flat space. Uh, with some uh, supersymmetric uh, super theory. And as we know very well, a supersymmetry algebra is an algebra that uh, enlarges the Poincaré algebra of, of symmetries by including some fermionic operators. And uh, uh, for instance, if we do four dimensional uh, minimal supersymmetry, of course, I'm, I'm writing obvious things. Uh, one has fermionic operators, q alpha and uh, q bar uh, alpha dot. And the anti-commutator is given by momentum or uh, translations. Or while the other ones, q, q, and q bar, q bar are zero. Uh, this is uh, without uh, uh, brain charges that, that, that Guido de de described in, um, in details. Now, if you are in a local quantum field theory, uh, there is a local stress energy tensor uh, whose integral is the momentum, and there are also currents for the supercharges. These are the supersymmetry currents that uh, Guido described in, uh, in great details. Uh, yes, so this is the Uh, and this is an object which has a spinor index and a vector index. Of course, the details depend on uh, well, how many supercharges we have in the various dimensions. And of course, this has the property that if we, in if we take a, a, a space like a uh, slice and we integrate it, we get the supercharges. Um, and, uh, well, a theory is supersymmetric if these currents are conserved. Now, uh, if we have a theory with Lagrangian description, um, and uh, we, will on we are restricted to theories with Lagrangian description because we want to compute path integrals, then, uh, well, a theory is supersymmetric if the Lagrangian is invariant under uh, supersymmetry transformations up to total uh, derivatives. So let me introduce an operator uh, delta. Uh, for me, this delta is the contraction of the supercharges with some parameter for supersymmetry. Uh, so this will be some scalar fermionic operator. Uh, and then the variation of the, of the Lagrangian should be a total derivative. Uh, for the theory to be supersymmetric. So, okay, so this is uh, pretty obvious. Um, now, so now what do we do? So first of all, we do an Euclidean. Uh, well, we do an Euclidean. One of the reasons that, uh, well, if you wish, path integral is a little bit better defined. So we go to Euclidean. Uh, so we have our theory on Rd. Uh, and then we would like to put this theory on a curved, uh, to substitute this Rd with some curved uh, manifold M. Um, now, when we do that, we have to modify the theory. So the theory will not be the same. Um, and okay, this will be described in, in detail by, by Guido, but we have to modify the theory. In particular, very practically, we have to modify the Lagrangian. And so in what sense we have the same theory that we had on flat space, we put it on a, on a, on a manifold. Since we changed the Lagrangian, we changed the theory. So what do we mean by it is the same theory? And the uh, uh, criterion that we will use is that at short distance, uh, short distances, we don't want to modify the theory. This is because if you got very short distances the, and we are on a smooth manifold, the metric is essentially flat. And so we should recover the flat space theory. So our criterion will be that we only well, we don't modify the theory in the UV, we only uh, modify it in the, in the infrared. Um, 
using some scale which comes from the metric on M as our reference, uh, reference scale. And so in other words, we will limit ourselves to uh, relevant, uh, so uh, restrict to relevant deformations. And we also restrict to local Lagrangians. Now, uh, even with these descriptions, uh, this procedure is still ambiguous. Um, in the sense that, in general, we can add uh, relevant deformations, which are constructed after the curvature invariance on the, on the manifold. And of course, all these curvature invariants, if we take the flat space limited, disappear. And so we have total freedom in adding these terms. And so this procedure is not unique. We don't find a unique answer. There are ambiguities, so there are parameters that we can play with. Uh, and uh, uh, I will call this ambiguity uh, as, as a background. In the sense that these ambiguities can be understood as some uh, background uh, uh, fields that one can turn on uh, when putting the theory on a, on, a, on a curved manifold. And so in particular, the important point is that these will be extra parameters besides just the pure geometry on M. There are other parameters involved. Can you give an example? <coughs> yeah, so as I said, you can, so you have some manifold M, uh, I don't know, you have some scalars, you can write curvature uh, couplings where the scalar is coupled to the curvature, and you can put whatever function you want in front of it, or if you want to, don't want to put a function, you can put a, a constant, but you can choose the constant. Um, so this is an ambiguity, which is not just fixed by the geometry on M, it's some extra data that you have to specify. So you want to introduce more terms than was in superoptical? Uh, so here I'm not, so I, I will get there, but uh, uh, well, in fact, this, uh, I mean, we, I mean, we already saw uh, Guido's lecture. In fact, those ambiguities, I say, they precisely correspond to background fields. And the fact that in supergravity you have extra fields besides the metric precisely corresponds to the fact that you don't just say, okay, I put my theory on a curve manifold, so this is the action. No, you also have to tell me what you do with other uh, fields. So, but now they have to be in the supergravity multiplet or they can be <coughs> in some other multiplet, for example, couples to flavor current? Well, essentially, you can do whatever you want. You have to... Uh, spe so, at this level, I'm not even talking about supersymmetry. So, this is true even without supersymmetry. Of course, without supersymmetry, you have more freedom. Uh, and the point that I'm going to make is that even with supersymmetry, you still have this freedom. And it's, it's really up to you uh, in the sense that, uh, for instance, Guido mentioned, if you have uh, some global symmetry, then this global symmetry can be coupled as a standard thing to a background gauge field. But this background gauge field is in a background vector multiplet that contains other bosonic fields, and you can turn them on. Those also, they, if you want, those parameters are not in the graviton multiplet, but still are something that I call the background, which is some choices that you have. Uh, and that are not just fixed by the geometry on M. Okay. So, um, so any other question? Again, this is very general. And it's more or less a repetition of what we, we, <laughs> we just said. But so on top of this, so this is true even without supersymmetry. On top of this, we want to add supersymmetry. And... Uh, um, and in particular, now we add supersymmetry. Now in the UV, as we said, we require that uh, uh, the theory becomes the flat space theory. And so this in particular means that the supercharges that we will preserve on a core manifold will be a subset of the supercharges that we had in flat space. So uh, let me call it curved Suzy algebra. Uh, as a subalgebra of the flat space algebra. Uh, but su super algebra. Um, 
So, so the supercharges will preserve on the manifold, will be a subset of the supercharges that we had in flat space. However, this supersymmetry algebra, so this is true at the level of counting uh, the, the, the generators of this algebra, but this algebra can be deformed. So, so if you want, maybe it's not, uh, well, it's not correct to say that this is a subalgebra, so these are the generators of, 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 of the algebra. Uh, but yeah, th th this one can be deformed. Uh, but of course, the deformation must be such that uh, if we send the curvature uh, of m to 0, this deformation must dis uh, disappear. So it's, uh, if you wish, a uh, relevant deformation of this, of this algebra. And we will see examples of this. Um, now, it turns out that uh, uh, given a certain uh, theory, a uh, supersymmetric theory in some dimension, uh, and given a certain manifold, it's not always possible to preserve supersymmetry on a, on a given manifold. So in particular, this problem of understanding on which, uh, on a given M, on which manifolds we can preserve supersymmetry is, is an non-trivial problem. So there will be some constraints on the, on the geometry of M. On the other hand, when it is possible, uh, in general, we have ambiguities. So even adding supersymmetry, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, to this story is not going to remove these ambiguities. Um, and so we will still have to talk about a manifold with a certain background. Uh, but of course, I mean, everything will be described in great details by uh, Guido. So, uh, so, what, uh, so how do we proceed to construct this, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, supersymmetry? So this is what Guido said at the very end of uh, his lecture. <coughs> so one uh, systematic approach is to couple <coughs> um, the quantum field theory to offshell supergravity. And then uh, solving for uh, uh, the supersymmetry equations uh, from the condition that comes from the graviton multiple in this offshore supergravity. So in particular, we set to zero the fermions. Uh, this guarantees that the variations of the, of, the, of the bosons is zero. And then we insist that also the variation of the fermions, in particular the gravitino, uh, is zero. And so this leads to uh, what is sometimes called in the, in the literature uh, a generalized killing spinor equation. And this is the equation that Guido wrote. So one takes the gravitino, uh, and in general, this is uh, given by the derivative, the covariant derivative of the supersymmetry parameter, epsilon, plus some contribution from the other fields. So this will be some matrix or some, uh, some function of the other supergravity fields. Uh, in particular, this function has an index mu at the end of the day because it has to match with this, this acts on epsilon, and this is the type of equation that, uh, that uh, one gets in supergravity. So in particular, in these supergravity fields, there are, of course, there is the metric, uh, but there are also the other fields, uh, uh, auxiliary or maybe dynamical, the other bosonic fields uh, that one has in the graviton multiplet. Uh, 
and of course these other bosonic fields have sp spin zero or, or one. <coughs> Uh, in the graviton multiplet. Um, so one has to solve this equation. Now, uh, as Guido stressed, uh, a very important feature of this equation, and this feature uh, is there if you are working with offshell supergravity, is that in this equation only the fields of, uh, uh, of the graviton multiplet appear, uh, not the fields uh, uh, in, say, vector or chiral multiplets or the, the other matter multiplets that we can use to construct our theory. And because of this, this equation is essentially, well, it's almost independent of the particular theory that we want to put on a curved manifold. This uh, almost depend only on the manifold the, that we want to study. So we can decouple the problem of studying supersymmetry on curved manifolds from the discussion of the very specific theory that we want to discuss. Um, now, this is an almost, because as, as Guido stressed, uh, still um, a given supergravity can have different offshell formulations, uh, which corresponds to the fact that one can construct different types of um, um, uh, these supercurrent multiplets that, that Guido described. Uh, and of course, this depends on the particular theory. So different theories might admit different types of multiplets, but once we know uh, which multiple you are going to use, then everything else is independent of the theory. Um, okay, and, and so we have to solve this equation for uh, uh, G mu nu, the other fields, uh, epsilon, and uh, if you find solutions, uh, this means that you can preserve supersymmetry on a core manifold, and the number of solutions that you find for epsilon for given uh, metric and background is telling you how many supercharges you can preserve on the manifold. Okay. Again, I'm not going to give any type of example because of this is what he's talking about. Uh, but we, 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 we need this in order to compute uh, our perfect integrals. Uh, So then, once we have this, uh, really our goal was to construct uh, the supersymmetric theory on the manifold. So how we do that? Uh, well, we just plug in the solution in supergravity. Um, So, uh, so substitute the solution uh, into uh, supergravity. Uh, and this gives you two things. Uh, it gives you uh, the deformed supersymmetry algebra. in the sense that in supergravity, of course, you have supersymmetry transformations. So you just take uh, uh, the, the background fields, and you take your epsilon, you substitute, and you read off what, are the, what is the supersymmetry algebra when it acts on the other types of multiplets. Uh, and then you substitute in the action on the particular matter action, and you read off what is the matter action. So uh, if you want a deformed matter action. Okay, so, so there is this very systematic way that we will uh, we'll explain uh, whose result will be this, uh, and this is what we need uh, uh, to perform the localization. Okay. So uh, again, I'm not gonna give any type of example. Uh, this is just a general philosophy. But is, is there any question? Any other questions? So, uh, why, why do we need to to use specialization, why do we need curved manifolds? I mean, 
is, is there some simplification of the localization? From from what I can understand, looking at some curve manifolds, <coughs> reduces the supersymmetry. Yeah, so I uh, gave you yesterday uh, motivations to do that. And the reason was that uh, as we take some theory, and we study this theory on various types of, of manifolds and on various types of backgrounds, essentially we get access to different classes of observables. I mean, you can think of it as the fact that, okay, you take a theory, if you just compute the path integral, this is, well, if at all it is a well-defined number, is a number. If you want to extract correlation function, you need sources. So if you want to compute uh, correlation function of local operators, you need really to insert sources and compute the result for generic sources, then you take variation and you compute correlation function. But you could do that on flat space. Okay. Absolutely, yes. I'm saying that if you study the theory on core manifolds with general backgrounds, you can get access to various types of other uh, observables. Like you can, uh, well, okay, some of them you can think of as Computing different types of correlators, I mentioned that you can have access to holomorphic and holomorphic or to conserve currents and so on, uh, but you might be interested to in uh, um, non-local operators or in some counting problems. You want to count some states or operators. Um, so it is a profitable exercise. Um. Well, absolute functions are better, de better defined on compact space-time, right? Yes, although uh, we don't have to limit to compact manifolds. So, okay, so first of all, we don't have to limit to closed manifolds. So we could consider, of course, manifold with boundaries. Um, okay, these, if you wish, are still compact, but we can introduce boundaries and we specify boundary conditions. In fact, we can also consider non-compact manifolds, but uh, uh, for instance, including some trapping potential. Uh, and this is what the omega background does, uh, at least in some way to think about it. So you can imagine that you have uh, some non-compact space. Let's say we are on R4. Uh, here we have problems uh, in, at infinity, uh, but we can introduce some potential, some trapping potential, such as all the excitations are confined uh, around the origin. Still, the manifold is non-compact, uh, but effectively this compactifies the problem and it gives you a, f a finite answer. And more or less, this is what the omega background does. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, uh, if you want, I'm studying the simplest case of compact manifolds, but once again, one can generalize things. Um, more generally, one could try to impose some boundary conditions such that you get a finite answer and uh, maybe removing divergence with boundary terms. So there are a lot of things that one can do, for sure. And the p p people uh, has, has done. Have uh, you, the first side of why you place the theory on the curved space, is if it is possible, the theory still suffer from some ambiguity. Yes. Uh, so which means uh, after localization, your Pauline function, for example, computed also suffers from this ambiguity. Yeah, but this ambiguity, as I said, are ambiguity in the sense that uh, if I give you just the metric, there is no unique way to preserve supersymmetry because mm -hmm. you have all these background fields. So by ambiguity, I mean that you have other parameters in the game so you have all these other background fields, some vector fields, some scalars. You, sp you can specify them with some constraints, but you have freedom. And so more generally, your partition function is not just a function of the metric and on the couplings that you have in flat space. It's also a function of some extra couplings that, if you wish, arise uh, when you put the theorem on a, on, a, on a curved manifold. But your final result should be a physical one. Well, the final result is a partition function of this theory. And then one question is, okay, why should we care about studying the theory, the Euclidean theory on a compact core manifold with all these background fields turned on? And uh, the answer, well, one answer is that these partition functions are related, they contain information uh, about the physical theory on flat Lorentzian space. So the information is translated, and you need to understand how. So if you want a particular partition function on a weird manifold, what physical information contains about the, phy the, the physical theory Lorentzian in flat space? And once you answer this question, then the composition that you did is, is, is u u useful. Well, it's more useful. I mean, you can, ha you can have different motivations, of course. Uh, and it is a non-trivial thing to understand what information is contained. Um, and in fact, uh, I mean, in, the, in this business, 
people starting looking at very simple examples, and now people is moving to more complicated examples, more complicated and, if you want, weird manifolds. And this is for two reasons. Why is, uh, I mean, one is, well, we do it because we can. So this is interesting if we can do it. These are non-perturbative computations. But the other motivation is that people understand that even these weird manifolds contain interesting physical information ab about the, the theory. Well, once again, different people can have different motivations. Okay, any, any other question? Okay, uh, so let me just make one remark, uh, which uh, Guido also, also made, but uh, this is uh, important. So we study this localization in Euclidean signature. And so when we go to Euclidean, we have to complexify the fields if we want to maintain uh, covariance, uh, for instance, because Pino representations have different dimensions, different properties when we change the signature. And so what it might happen is that, uh, uh, so you take some, um, you take some, uh, you start with some Lorentzian theory with some background field, you go to Euclidean, and uh, uh, the background for these fields, so if you want background, uh, is, not, uh, is not the analytic continuation of a real background in, in, in Lorentzian signature. Uh, rotation. Um, and so, so in particular, this means that uh, uh, this, this uh, so it means that, okay, we can preserve supersymmetry by the, the price of uh, uh, losing a uh, reflection positivity. And the reflection positivity is the um, Euclidean version of uh, unitarity. So it means that somehow we are studying a theory with uh, some non-unitary deformation. Uh, now, as Nikita remarked, this is still interesting, and st in fact, we, we still do it. Uh, but we should remember this fact, uh, in particular, if we try to compare this with uh, what we expect from the physical theory. However, what it might happen is that, we, so we study some theory that in the infrared uh, goes, for instance, to a CFT. This is an example that uh, appears in many cases. Uh, so, for instance, we could start, I don't know, with uh, super QCD in the conformal window, the theory that we are at Lagrangian, this theory is not conformal, but if you are in the conformal window, the infra there is an infrared fixed point, or we might be in three dimensions and we are studying some young mills chen simons theory, and the infrared it goes just to chen simons which is conformal. So we have plenty of examples in, uh, in localization um, that are uh, used in, uh, in uh, localization. Uh, and now, as, as we explained, once uh, the theory flows to a super field theory, some of the operators become uh, redundant. So these are operators which are either zero or fixed to some C number <coughs> that decouple from the theory. And so it might happen that actually these background fields, which were complex and were uh, ruining uh, reflection positivity, couple to these redundant uh, operators. And so then we, I mean, the fraction positive is not really broken because they couple to an operator which is essentially zero. And so in this case, if we are computing something that does not depend on the RG flow, and so essentially we are doing the computation in the infrared, uh, then uh, the results that we obtain are compatible with uh, unitarity or reflection positivity, okay? But if this is not the case and the theory is massive, we might have some uh, um, Okay, differences with the, with the physical theory. Okay. When the SFT is on the on, on curved uh, background, uh, the, the background fields may introduce a normally to, to conserve currents. Well, yeah, you can have this, the, the conformal anomaly, of course, and the stress, of the trace of the stress tends to... Uh, shortening condition for the multiple, for the current multiple. Uh, now you still have, uh, you still have, so besides the super conformal multiplet, you have the multiplet of the anomalies, which contains all the anomalies, it contains the trace of the stress tensor, the gamma trace of the supersymmetry current, if you have an R symmetry, it's the divergence of the R current, and so you still have uh, this 
uh, separate multiple. So there is a multiple that contains all the anomalies. Okay. Okay, uh, so, uh, so now that we uh, quickly reviewed or previewed how to preserve supersymmetry on core manifolds, uh, now we want to go to the problem that we want to address. So we want to um, understand how to perform, uh, how to use localization to compute these, these path integrals. Um, and so, uh, well, this, this, this story is a sort of repetition of what we discussed in the first lecture, but it's the extension. So it's an infinite dimensional version of these localization theorems that we discussed in the final dimensional case. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so um, so we can go a little, little bit quick because the, the, the main steps we, we already understood. So essentially what we do, so we start with some theory, with some action. So this is a supersymmetric theory. So we have constructed a supersymmetric theory on a curve manifold. So we have this, this action on the curve manifold and we have some uh, uh, fermionic uh, symmetry, some fermionic generator. Q uh, such that the action is invariant. So QS is equal to zero. And sometimes I will use delta instead of Q. So, um, so now this is a, a fermionic generator. And so the square of this can be zero, uh, but more generally it can be some bosonic symmetry in the theory. So in general we have the Q squared and some delta b, some bosonic symmetry in the theory. So what is this delta b? Well, this will be uh, some, uh, um, um, either some, some uh, translation or a rotation, so something that acts on space-time, or can be some Lorentz uh, rotation, or can be some rotation by the symmetries in the theory, like some R symmetry rotation or some global symmetry rotation. So uh, as we discussed various times, we are interested in computing these sort of path integrals, so a Euclidean compact manifold. And we set h bar to 1. Uh, but instead of studying this, we study a deformation of this problem. So with some real parameter t, in which uh, we deform the action uh, by some term, and we want uh, some Q exact term in such a way that the result uh, is not going to change. This is what we did in the, in the finite dimensional case. So we deform it by, so T is our, uh, is a number, is our parameter, and V is some, is here is some functional, uh, so maybe the notation is not the best. This is not the vec it has nothing to do with the vector field that we had before. Now this is a, some functional of the fields that we use to, to deform the action. Uh, so this is Q exact, it's Q of something, uh, but we also we want to be Q closed, which in our la language means that it is supersymmetric. Uh, so in particular we require that uh, delta B, which is Q squared of V is equal to zero. And if you want, this is the equivalent condition that, uh, th th that we had before. First of all, we should impose that a uh, form was equivariant. This means that it was invariant under the symmetry. And then we can start discussing whether it is closed or exact. So the first thing, it has to be equivariant. And so this is the equivalent condition. If you want, it's invariant under Q squared. And, and so then this is Q exact. So, uh, so now, as we did before, we can ask, okay, what is the dependence? So we have deformed the theory by something, and we can ask what is the dependence 
on this parameter, and so if we do that, uh, so here we bring down this QV, Uh, however, since this is closed, really we can take a Q to act on the whole thing. And so this is, uh, if you want, a total variation of the integral with respect to supersymmetry. So, um, so from here you might say, okay, just by doing a field redefinition, uh, this has to be zero, essentially because, well, assuming, so assuming that the measure is invariant under Q, uh, which in particular implies that there are no anomalies, And so in particular, we don't want this delta B to be anomalous. So sh this should be an anomalous theory in the theory. So assuming that the measure is invariant, then by the standard argument you say, okay, if I take uh, some, uh, some integral, and then I do a field definition in which I perform the transformation by Q, which is more rotation, since this was a field definition that two things has to be equal, the difference is precisely given by well, this transformation in infinitesimal by the action of Q, and so this should be zero. Um, however, uh, one has to be a little bit more careful, uh, essentially because we are in an infinite dimensional space, and so, in fact, we can, so you know that, uh, uh, so this fermionic symmetry is essentially, if you think in terms of a supermanifold, so we have our fields, the supersymmetric theory, so we have bosonic and fermionic fields, and you can think that they form just a boson, uh, supermanifolds of field configurations. So this Q is a translation in, uh, in this uh, space of su superfields, a translation along the uh, Grassmann coordinates. Um, and, uh, um, and so in particular you also know that uh, so, uh, the, 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 the action of Q is essentially a derivative. So th this action is a derivative with respect to the Grassmann coordinates. And so this term in fact is a total derivative uh, on the supermanifold of field configurations. And I say okay, so once again, so this is a total derivative and we know that uh, the integral of a total derivative is, is zero. Uh, but of course, in general, we have to be careful about um, boundary terms. So we can have boundary terms in particular at infinity in field space. And so these terms can invalidate this argument. So one has to be careful that there are no boundary terms at infinity in field space. However, you see that here we have some exponential uh, suppression factor. And so if this is uh, essentially if the action or the uh, deformation term are su such that they kill, they give an exponential suppression for com field configuration at infinity, uh, then you can make sure that there are no boundary terms and then this argument goes through. But this is something that one has to check. And in fact, there are examples in which the naive argument will tell you that uh, uh, there should not be dependence on T, but in fact, if you do the computation, you do find dependence on T. And, and the reason is, is this. So is, yes. so is there a relationship? This look, sounds very similar to uh, a Tia-Patodi Singer index theorem versus a Tia Singer index theorem. Also, you have to worry about boundary terms and contributions to the index from the boundary. Is there a connection? Well, as you said, it's the same as the same mechanism uh, that, uh, well, here, it, I mean, you understand it very, very simply. It's, this is just a total derivative, and you have to be careful about what you do at the, at the boundary. Um, I'm counting something topological. This is like this that I'm asking. This, this kind of um, I mean, in this case, I guess it's a Witten index. 
But you know, I mean, then it depends what boundary conditions you would. Uh, I mean, in the case in which it is not zero, these are quite non trivial cases that uh, has been, I mean, I just know a couple of examples. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, what could try to understand what type of boundary conditions you have. Uh, but now this is infinite in field space, so it's yeah, kind of non-standard. Uh, non um, yeah, I don't have a sharp answer, but uh, I just know a couple of examples. So yeah. Okay. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, so, uh, so, uh, so, so, so now this, this argument, which, uh, I mean, as, as, as I said, this is a copy of the finite dimensional argument up to the fact that one has to be a little bit more careful, uh, shows us uh, three things, uh, roughly speaking. So first of all, so suppose that uh, uh, this term was not a deformation term that you add to the action, but in fact you have your action, and the action in general is a sum of various terms, and s one or some of these terms are Q exact. So they can be written as Q acting on, 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 on something else. In this case, T, instead of being a deformation, will be just one of the couplings that you have in your, uh, in your theory. And the, ar the argument shows you <coughs> that when you compute this particular path integral, there is no dependence of this partition function on that particular coupling. So you don't have a dependence on the couplings that appear in front of Q exact terms. On, uh, let's say, couplings. Uh, in front of uh, Q exact. And so we learned that uh, in general we compute these partition functions, but they uh, need not depend on all the couplings that you have in, in your Lagrange, and in general they only depend on a, on, a, on, a, on a subset. So this simplifies somehow the type of answers that you can obtain. Uh, of course, here I'm only considering uh, the, the pure path integral with the action, but we could insert operators, in particular uh, order operators in, 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 the, in, the, in the integrand. The argument will go through, and so what we learn is that when we compute expectation values of uh, operators, uh, they only depend on the uh, Q cohomology class of the operator. So if you change your operator by something which is, once again, Q exact, you're not going to change the expectation values. Uh, in particular, if an operator is Q exact, uh, the expectation value is, uh, is zero. Uh, and then finally, well, the, 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 the observation that uh, I mean led to, 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 to do this um, procedure, uh, well, the patenter is not modified by this deformation. Okay, and so uh, as we now know, we can use this fact to our advantage to simplify the problem. Um, let me make a comment here. So we already made a comment about this uh, going to Euclidean signature. That we have to complexify all the fields. So in general, if you have some real fields, it becomes complex. And if you have some complex field, the fields and the, what used to be the dagger becomes independent fields. And in fact, I will use a notation in which I put a tilde. Uh, so a tilde on a field will mean that is uh, an independent field, which, however, should be the complex conjugate in Lorentz's signature. Uh, however, we, so, so now we have, the, uh, we have double number of fields. However, we don't, we don't want to do the path integral over all these double number of fields. Uh, first of all, because this will not be, so what we are really, really interested in is the analytic continuation of the Lorentzian theory to Euclidean. And if we double the number of integrals, this is not the analytic continuation. It's just a different problem. Uh, also, is a problem that in general doesn't have convergence, so it will also be a bad problem. 
So we really want to uh, still integrate over, if you want, half of the fields in, in, in Euclidean signature. And so this means that we have to choose a contour uh, in, the, in the space of fields. And, uh, um, and in general, we have to choose, I mean, if we want to have a well-defined problem, we should choose a contour such that the patina is, is, is convergent. And, uh, uh, and now that we do this deformation by QV, we'd better choose this contour to give us convergence for all values of t. Uh, there is also another thing that we might want to be careful about. We have this Q squared was equal to delta B. Uh, so this is some, uh, I mean, this act on the manifolds of, of fields, configurations. And so we probably also want to choose a contour such that, uh, which is, uh, if you want, closed uh, uh, under the action of this uh, delta B. We don't want delta B to take the contour and move us outside the contour. Um, because otherwise, the complexified theory is, is invariant, but it's, it's less killer what happens to the theory where we integrate on the contour. Short question. Um, the you said the vacuum expectation well, is dependent on the cohomology classes yes. of operators. How can we make sense of cohomology classes if Q doesn't square to zero? Uh, yeah, so essentially, so like in uh, equivariant uh, cohomology, we need to, first of all, to restrict to equivariant forms. And here, too, we need to restrict to operators which are not just supersymmetric, but also invariant under delta B. Uh, so, well, sorry. Uh, I mean, if the operator is invariant under Q, of course, it's also invariant under delta B. Uh, but then when we, so this is the equivariant cohomology of, of Q. Uh, when we only uh, deform by things which are Q exact, but also invariant under delta B. Is the choice of contour unique? No. Uh, so you might have uh, different choices, and uh, um, so in cases in which these different choices are disconnected, in the sense that they are not uh, continuously deformable one of the other, uh, the interpretation should be that you have different quantizations of the same uh, classical Lagrangian that lead to different quantum theories. Because different contours can lead you to different answers. But they are from the same Lorentzian theories? Well, the same Lagrangian. Of course, when you quantize, you don't need to get the same quantum theory. So you say the VEVs only depend on the Q homology classes of the operators. Does this contain more information than if you topologically twisted the theory? I mean, it does, does because... It have operators that don't satisfy delta B equals zero, or does it contain more information about those operators? Well, uh, it, it contains more information because this supersymmetry on core manifold is not just the twist. So this is something that uh, Guido will probably stress. Uh, but uh, so topological twist definitely goes into this framework. Yeah. It's one way to preserve supersymmetry on a core manifold. But, and, and this is the original setup, right, of the 80s. Uh, but uh, if you want the more modern point of view is that this is just one example, but there are many more ways of preserving supersymmetry. But all of them, it only depends on the Q homology classes? Yes, so in a generalized sense, you might say that is, but it's not a topological twist because uh, in general, the theory that you obtain is, is, is not topological and is not just twisted. But if you remove these words, more, more or less the, the ideas are the same. Okay, so it's sort of a cohomological theory, but it could Well, it is, but it's just it's not the cohomology that you get from the topological twist. Sure. Yeah. Also, uh, in this uh, statement about the vacuum expectation values, uh, we have restricted implicitly on, on the Q closed operators. Yes. Yes, because otherwise, I mean, if you have, even if you have a supersymmetric theory, but you ask about super operators that do not preserve supersymmetry, you are not going to get anything from uh, localization, right. essentially because the argument breaks down, right? If you insert an operator which is not Q-closed, it's not true that the deformation, what the, part, the uh, you know, expectation values are independent of T. And so there is just no localization you can do. Uh, so this has to do with what I said in the first lecture. I mean, localization allows us to compute some path integrals. Uh, we, cannot, we are not solving the theory. Uh, that, that, that would be great, but it's, it's not the case. Okay, any, any other question? Yeah. 
Okay, so we want to use this fact to our advantage. Um, and so, um, and so, um, okay, so, so we know that if we take this parameter to be zero, this is our original path integral. And now, suppose that we can find some v um, such that the bosonic part, uh, the bosonic real part, of uh, QV is, posi is a positive uh, semi-definite. So that means on all field configurations uh, which uh, live on this contour that you chose, uh, the, 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 the real part of the bosonic part of QV is, is non-negative. Okay? Suppose that this is the case. Then uh, we take the limit T goes to plus infinity and you see from there that any field configuration for which QV is not zero is going to be infinitely suppressed. And so only the configuration for which uh, the boson real part of QV is zero are going to survive. And so the path integral localizes to a neighborhood of these configurations. So, uh, so phi such that QV is bigger than zero uh, is suppressed. And so, uh, and so we have this picture similar to what we had yesterday in which we have our space of field configurations uh, where we are integrating, but in fact the integral uh, localizes to a neighborhood of some very special configurations uh, where this cube, the real bosonic part of QV is, is zero. Okay, so uh, however, as we saw in the example yesterday, uh, still we need to take into account the neighborhood of the point and this, uh, this there appear of the fact that still we had this Gaussian integral to do. And, uh, and in this setting we have the same, uh, the same thing. So let's expand uh, so let's go around one of these points. Let, let's expand around there. So let's take our phi to be some phi zero, which is one of these uh, special points. And then let's call phi hat uh, the deviation from that. And for reason that will be clear in a moment, let me take uh, some power of t in front of it. Uh, and so now uh, we take this s plus uh, t q v and we expand. So, okay, so let's take s first. So on s we have s of phi zero. Uh, and then, uh, um, and then we do expansion around, um, around phi zero, but the various terms that we obtain are suppressed by t, by powers of t. And so here all the other terms are of order t to the minus a half. So what about qv? Well, first of all, so qv of phi zero is zero, this is what the condition that we imposed. Um, then we can look at the first order. Now, since QV is positive uh, and QV is zero, then the first derivative must be zero. It must be uh, at, uh, at a local minimum. And so also the first derivative is zero, and so we jump to the second order derivative. Uh, and there, these powers of t cancels out. So this will be the quadratic expansion of QV uh, around phi. Uh, zero, and this is quadratic in the fields phi hat. And then if we keep expanding, then we get some negative powers of t 
so this is also suppressed. Um, and now you, 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 you might ask, uh, okay, but why did I choose this particular normalization of T that seems to be important here? And the reason is that essentially that, uh, uh, of course, I mean, you can always rescale the fields, but if you do that, you're going to modify the measure. So what we want to use as, uh, are uh, canonically normalized fields. Um, and now you add this uh, uh, deformation term QV uh, as here, and we are taking T to be very large. So of course, okay, this argument depends a little bit of what QV, uh, wh wh what you chose for, for, for QV. Once again, suppose that I chose the trivial example in which V is actually the zero functional. Well, then, uh, of course, I'm not going to localize to in, in any sense. And in particular, this is not going to become large because this is identically zero. So, of course, there are some assumptions of what type of QV uh, we are choosing. In particular, we want this QV. Wh what I'm going to say is buried is this QV is non-degenerate. So it affects all the fields in the theory. But if this is the case, this is going to dominate over S because this is very large. Still, we want to have uh, canonically normalized fields. Otherwise, if they're not canonically normalized, we should rescale them, and this would affect the, the measure. Uh, but in fact, this is precisely what it does. So this is essentially the imposed condition that we are still using canonically normalized fields. And in fact, you see that this term uh, remains uh, canonically normalized. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, so, so, uh, I'm confused that you know two terms of phi zero and the phi hat. Yes. Uh, actually, in the in the in the finite dimensional version of the localization, we have some uh, metric on the manifold to distinguish the 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 zero points and the normal normal vectors uh, due to the metric. But uh, for the for the configuration space, it's infinite dimensional. So how to di distinguish the the zero point zero points and the well, I mean, you need to do some separation of the fields between your phi zero and some orthogonal directions. So this parameterizes orthogonal direction to phi zero. But in fact, you don't. OK, I mean, if, we, if I go a couple of lines uh, on, you will see that, in fact, you don't have to choose uh, an orthogonal parameterization. And essentially, this will uh, take care of itself. So let me just go, go on a, a couple of lines. Um, OK, so, um, so we have this expansion. And so, uh, so what do we see from this expansion? We see the following. So first of all, uh, we get this contribution from the special configurations that we localize on. Uh, so this is uh, our phi 0 phi zero such that uh, qv of phi zero is equal to zero. Um, and then, uh, OK, uh, so this phi hat for us uh, parameterize orthogonal directions. And so our path integral has reduced to a path integral. So we have this phi zero, but we also have the orthogonal direction that we should in uh, integrate over. But now the point is that this is the quadratic action. So this is expanded okay, to quadratic order. And so we actually know how to do this, right? We know we can do this path integral exactly. This is just a Gaussian integral. And if we do that, we get a uh, uh, determinant, essentially, of the operator, right? This is just the standard Gaussian integration, uh, while this remains non-trivial in general. So we remain with the integration over phi 0, e to the minus s of phi 0. And the fact that we integrated these guys out is what we can call a super determinant of QV at phi zero quadratic one of Yeah, so let me comment on this, on this formula. So first of all, uh, well, these, these pi zeros are not points. And this is, this is true even in the finite dimensional case. So I just discussed the special. If you remember, at some point, I had a, an assumption. Assume that the fixed points are, uh, are isolated. But in general, they are not isolated. And uh, in fact, as I promised, that in the quantum theory case, I will discuss the general case. In general, these configurations are not isolated. 
Uh, and so you should integrate still over, over them. You localize on a submanifold. Um, and so you should integrate over this, over this submanifold. What is this super determinant? Well, this is just, if you want, fermionic determinant over bosonic determinant, because if you have bosonic variables, they go into the denominator. If you have fermionic variables, they go in the numerator. So this is just a convenient notation for that. Uh, this is the determinant of the quadratic expansion around phi zero. And uh, uh, where, well, there is a square root. Now, if you have complex fields, uh, you, 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 you naturally have the square of this, so there is no problem with that. If you have real fields, uh, well, you have the square root, and the square root in some cases might create some troubles. This is related to, for instance, the parity anomalies and so on. So I will not discuss this in, to, in, uh, in details. Uh, it depends on the examples. Um, but this is something to take into account. So finally, what is this prime? Well, this prime is the standard thing that, uh, uh, in general, we might find uh, zero modes. Okay? So zero modes means that this determinant is some zero eigenvalue. So what we should we do if we have a zero mode? Uh, this would imply that if, we, I, if I take the determinant of face value, uh, either I have a zero above, and the expression is zero, or I have a zero here, and this is divergent. But in fact, what I'm instructed to do is that I should remove the zero modes from the determinant. Now, if I have a bosonic zero mode, uh, I should now integrate over this uh, zero mode. Now, what is a zero mode? Well, a zero mode is precisely a coordinate along these manifolds on which this S, uh, well, sorry, this, this deformation was just uh, constantly zero. This is what a zero mode is. So in fact, this integral of phi zero is precisely the integral of the zero modes that we are removing from here. Okay? And this should answer to your question. So yeah, so even if you didn't uh, do this properly with taking orthogonal fields, you will find the zero modes, and the zero mode is precisely the parameter you have to integrate over. Uh, if you have fermionic zero modes, then uh, what does it mean? It means that you need to reabsorb these zero modes. So either, so here you, it looks like you get zero. So either you insert some operator which absorbs the zero modes, because you remember that uh, in Grassmann variables, integral of d theta is zero, but integral of d theta theta is, is equal to one. Uh, or you need to expand these to the next uh, order in the fermions uh, and then pick up the next component, uh, which, well, depending on the fermion, on fermion zero mode, give you a non-trivial result. And uh, we will see an example of this um, later on. Are you saying that uh, the zero mode can be lifted by higher order uh, it's not lifted, it's just that the, so this term, so the, this in general should be thought as a function of the fermionic coordinates. If you have a zero mode, it means that the integral of the... Uh, yeah, I mean. So either you insert the operator, that part is clear. So if you insert the operator, okay, this yeah. is the contribution. You said you can go to higher order. Yes, then you need to expand this to the, you have to look at the next term, which depends explicitly on the zero mode. <laughs> Uh, in, this, in this way, right? If you have a function of theta, this is telling you that this is, and let's say that f is equal to f0 plus f1 theta, this is selecting for you f1. So it's telling you that you should pick up this term here. But what are you expanding? This is what I'm Well, because here I, 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 so we didn't, uh, so if you want, we localize on a bosonic manifold, and you might ask, okay, what about uh, why here we are just uh, looking at the bosonic part of QV, why it's only not, uh, not solving fermionic equations? And the answer is that, so in the fermions, your action is always a, a polynomial which is linear in each of the fermionic variables because they are anti-commuting. So nothing weird can happen. There are no non-linearities in the fermions. But still, you might have some zero, some flat direction in the fermionic directions. And in that case, what you have to do is that you have to take the derivative in that direction. And so, um, yes. And so essentially, you have to, th this object here, you have to uh, take into account the zero modes and look at the, at the next term. And, and we will see one example how to do that. 
Oh, uh, I wanted to ask because so here we are doing a seven point approximation because the integral localizes its exact. But uh, so phi zero, strictly speaking, shouldn't be the one that uh, I mean the extrem extremizes z. If we only keep the zeros, uh, they are of course the absolute minima because q v is definitely uh, semi positive. But uh, shouldn't we include also possible subleading saddles? Uh, well, in general, no, unless something weird happen. Uh, so suppose you have something like this, so we are only taking this, but these guys here, they contain uh, e to the minus t uh, qv. So uh, at least uh, um, naively, you would say that these are suppressed. Um, now, there are some examples in which there is something weird going on, and then that may, may evade this, but... Yeah. Insisting, so when you choose the side of point of sign to satisfy the PPI conclusion, should this non-zero loss of the boson and the form that can call to determine Well, I mean, in this, in this determinant, you have uh, a lot of cancellations, but uh, uh, it's not that you're left just, just with the zero mode, so there is no uh, perfect cancellation. Um, yes, my time is over, but this is a question. <laughs> uh, yes, so, um, so there are lots of cancellations, but th th you don't have a full cancellation. Um, and you can understand this with index theorems. Mm -hmm. Now, in the examples I will do, I will take the pedantic uh, approach of actually doing the computation explicitly of these determinants. But I think uh, Zabzin will uh, uh, use the full power of index theorems and will teach you how to, to, to use them. Uh, these integrals are in general finite dimensional or infinite? Okay, good point. So no, in general they are not finite dimensional. Uh, so in general you might, so you start with a path integral and you might get a simpler path integral, which is still a path integral, so it's still hard. Uh, however, in favorable circumstances, this turns out to be finite dimensional, and these are the cases in which we are really in business, because then this integral is just a finite dimensional integral that we can have hope to, to solve. Uh, but uh, there is no argument that this should happen in general. And this depends on the, on the Q operator being nice, or on what? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I don't think, at least I don't have a systematic understanding of this. Um, um, yeah, I mean, of course, it ultimately depends on uh, what, the, I mean, what, what type of supersymmetry you have and what type of manifolds. But uh, usually if you have enough supersymmetries, this reduces to a finite dimensional manifold. But if you have only real supercharges, uh, well, I, I don't have a systematic understanding.